All right, everyone. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you are in this fantastic country of ours, um, or the world, actually, in multiple different countries. Um, my name is Wally. Um, I'm a principal program manager with Cyrusen. I've been with Cyrusen for a little over three years now, after spending 22 years um, or so at con in Microsoft, in the primarily in the configuration manager product group. And as you can see on the slide, which hopefully you all are seeing, we're doing a session on Windows 10 migration. Um, and this is part one of a series. So we've got a three-part series planned, and we'll see how the timing goes on it. Um, I assume we will not get done in two, and we will take all three, and doubt we'll go beyond that, but we'll see where we go. Um, we are being recorded, so the session um, is being recorded, and it will be posted up to our um, Vimeo site, which I'll talk about here in just a moment. So this is a um, three-part series, and hopefully you all are registered for part two next Wednesday and part three the following Tuesday. Um, so Wednesday, Wednesday, and Tuesday. Um, so thank you for taking a little time out of your day to join us in this presentation. Um, so let me go ahead and get to the housekeeping um, stuff. You guys are all in listen-only mode, so you're not able to unmute and speak audibly when you have questions or comments or whatever. However, you do have access to the questions panel in your um, GoToWebinar interface. So at any point in time throughout the broadcast, when you have questions or comments to make, please feel free to type them up and, and enter them at the appropriate time. Um, I would just ask you to put a little context around that. Just don't say why as a question, because by the time I get to the questions, which won't be till the end of the presentation, um, I will not have any idea what why you're asking about uh, from something I said possibly an hour earlier. So just put a little context around that. That would be fantastic. But please do feel free to ask questions that you have. Um, I will answer those questions to the best of my ability at the end of the presentation. And I will keep the recording going through the Q&A portion so that they are recorded um, for the later playback if you wish to respond or look at those or listen to those later on or share with someone else. So as I mentioned, we are being recorded. And after the recording, I'll get this converted and uploaded to our inter internal site. And um, Melanie will go ahead and get it uploaded to the Vimeo site. So we put all of our recordings up on Vimeo.com, V-I-M-E-O.com slash Team Cyrusen, all one word. So if you go to Vimeo.com slash Team Cyrusen, and you'll find we've got I don't know, well over 100 different presentations up there, I'm sure. Um, and you can go ahead and view those. In fact, I did a really quickly condensed version of, of the first two parts of this, press, of this series um, back at our Config Manager Day back in April, I believe it was. Um, and I did a 35, 40 minutes on <laughs> migrating to Windows 10, which obviously was not nearly enough time since we're doing this in a two-parter for the migration, another part for management of your systems after the fact. So. Anyway, that'll be available by the end of the week, certainly, so you can share it with others or go back and um, review the, the content if you wish to later on. So again, feel free to ask questions throughout. I don't expect that I'll be um, interacting and looking forward to those questions until the end, so just um, be aware of that. So with that, let's go ahead and move along. So our agenda for today, I'll spend just a couple of minutes talking about who we are at Cyrusen as a as a company and how we can help you out with your um, configuration manager needs, including Windows 10 migrations. Then for the meat of the presentation, it's going to be talking about things such as what version of configuration manager should you use to deploy and manage Windows 10 devices. Talk about whether or not you want to do an in-place upgrade or an operating system deployment process. Then we'll go through the actual process. What do you need to do in your configuration manager environment to prepare for this migration and management of Windows 10? Then we'll talk about how do you assess your readiness for the Windows 10 update? Because as you know, each new operating system has some little things in it that um, are enhancements and new requirements. And some of your existing operating systems, applications, drivers, or hardware may not be compatible with Windows 10. So how do you find those things out before you start your deployment and have a bunch of failures? And then we'll actually go through the process of moving from Windows 7, Windows 8.1 to Windows 10. I have two virtual machines that I'll be upgrading in an in-place scenario. One is Windows 7, another one is Windows 8.1. I'll talk about those later on. And lastly, monitoring deployment status. Um, 
So I'm not sure how far we'll get through today's presentation. We may not get through all this stuff. Um, we'll see how we go. And again, we get part two coming up next week, and we'll pick up part two where we left off with them um, today, however, however far we get. Um, so before I jump in, let me go ahead and just state I've been at a lot of different events, whether they're conferences such as IT Dev Connections or, or Experts Live or Microsoft Ignite or the old MMS or the current MMS um, conferences or user group presentations. And this is a very common topic that people talk about, how do you deploy and manage Windows 10. So there's lots of great resources out there for you on this topic. But one of the things I wanted to bring up here is that whenever they have one of these presentations, um, the speaker always polls the audience and asks them, how far are you guys along in your Windows 10 migration? Um, how many are in the planning stage? How many plan or have started it? How many have completed? How many plan to get there in the next 30 days versus 60 days, X number of months, a year, and so on? Um, and it's always surprising to me how small the numbers are for those that have completed the process of migration to Windows 10. Um, it's usually a, a really, really small percentage, certainly less than 10% of the audience when they're polled um, has admitted that they've, um, they've completed their migration. Um, and just it's just the way it is in corporate America. Um, and not just America, obviously the rest of the world as well, it takes a long time to replace your operating systems for your end users. So it takes a long time. There's a lot of planning involved with it. You want to make sure that you're impacting your end users as little as possible so that they're as, as productive as possible um, for the maximum amount of time. So it just takes time to go through this process. So you are, a lot of people are doing their due diligence and doing the proper planning and testing and evaluating. Um, in lab, in pilot environments before they go rolling this out to production, which is fantastic to see. So all that just to state that um, um, if you have not done your migration yet, don't feel bad because a lot of people out there that haven't, um, you still find a lot of people running Windows XP even though it's no longer in, in product support from Microsoft and no longer supported by Configuration Manager, for example, So, you, but you still see people running it. It just takes a long time for people to get off of a platform that works for them so, and move to something new. Although the world is moving and you're not going to have much of a choice. So, all right. So let's go ahead and move along. Uh, all right. So who, who are we at Cyrusen? So we're a software and services company. Uh, we started uh, about five years or so ago doing consulting on System Center products, primarily around Microsoft System Center and we um, service manager. And we found the number of gaps in the solution for service manager with our, when we were doing our consulting. So we started writing some little quick little applications, um, tools to help out with the deployment and use of Service Manager. And we found out that our customers are really excited about those apps, so we started developing more and more. So now we've moved into the software business, still providing consulting services, as you see on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, so service management is the area that we first were founded as a company as far as software goes creating software to help you with your service manager implementation from an administrative side of house as well as an end user side of the house. Um, configuration manager obviously is, is the most commonly used, most widely used of the system center family of products and it's been around for, you know, if you count SMS 1.0, it's been around for um, well over 20 years now. Um, so there's tons of different customers out there and we found that a lot of people wanted go further in their asset management than what Configuration Manager or the old SMS technologies would do. So we created some asset management products that would go ahead and grab your Configuration Manager hardware data, um, user data, and so on, and bring it over to the CMDB as part of Service Manager and let you extend that data. So give you rich, true lifecycle management of your hardware and software assets. Configuration Manager. Um, you've all probably heard that this year we've released a web-based portal for Configuration Manager. So if you have IT staff, help desk, and desktop support teams or whatever that you want to have utilize the power of Configuration Manager but are afraid to give them the Configuration Manager console because of all of its complexity and power that it possesses, um, this is a web-based portal that's scaled down and very easily lets you um, tune or um, restrict what features that your people have access to through this web-based console. 
And of course, for the past couple of years now, we've had some free configuration manager apps to help you do remote management of clients or send announcements to your clients, uh, user device affinity, relationship management, and so on. So those have been around for a while. And of course, I already mentioned consulting services, which we can help you out with your deployment and management of all your um, different systems and our products. So just some awards and recognitions. We've got over 1,200 customers in 63 countries around the world. Um, as you can see, tons of consulting hours out there and lots of, of licensed end users as far as customers. But what we're really proud of is that renewal rate. And what we find is that 99% of the customers who buy into our technology, they like it enough, they appreciate it, they see the value of it and how it enhances their infrastructures and environments that they go ahead and renew their um, support maintenance agreements on a year-by-year -year basis. So that's great to see. And then just, I won't go through this obviously because there's a ton of different customers on here, but these are just different areas of technologies um, and industry where you see some different names on here as far as companies that um, are customers of Cyrusen, including Microsoft and Dell and San Francisco Giants baseball team and so on. And then lastly, where we fit into the platform. Um, obviously, you see in the middle of System Center, and System Center can be hosted in an on-premise environment, either physical boxes or Hyper-V, or you can host in a cloud environment with Microsoft Azure or other um, solutions. And Cyrus and solutions fit on top of that. Now, for what we're talking about in this series as far as uh, migration to Windows 10, certainly our configuration manager portal could be something that you could look at for helping you deploy task sequences and our OSD front end um, to help with um, like bare metal deployments. Um, and that would be we sit on top of System Center to provide all those functionalities inter interacting with the core System Center technologies. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into uh, our topics. And again, I don't know how far we'll get today. We'll go as far as we can today, and then we'll just pick up where we leave off today in the next week's presentation and, and go from there. So first off is Configuration Manager support for Windows 10. What version of Configuration Manager should you be using? Configman 2007, Configman 2012, or the current branch release of Configuration Manager? Uh, why did that not click and move on? There we go. Okay, so which version to use? Uh, well, I'm going to start way back, and way back being Configman 2007. It's out of product support, so no one really should be using it. I still do see, when I'm at events and I poll people, I still do some, see some people out there on Configman 2007. Um, I, I know it's, it's a product. It worked great. Um, and a lot of times it's one of those, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So no reason to replace it if it is working fine, which it does work fine for most of your features. Um, so I understand the um, thought process behind just sticking with what you have. However, it is out of product support. There's not going to be any more updates to it, no um, fixes for it, so no hot fixes or no cumulative roll-ups or any updates or anything like that for it. Um, it had very basic support of Windows 10 at the client, so you could put the client on it, the configman client, you could do hardware inventory, software inventory, you could deploy application, deploy software updates, but that was really it. So just some very basic um, support of Windows 10 as a client in Configuration Manager. It had no OSD support of Windows 10 at all, so you were not able to deploy Windows 10 utilizing Config Manager 2007. So you had to use MDT of their manual processes to deploy the environment, and then you could go ahead and install the Config Man client on it and do your basic stuff. So that's the scenario, but again, that's been out of product support for a while now, so I would not be using it. Certainly, there's no reason to stick on it. Config Man 2012. So there's been a number of different service packs for it and an R update for it and cumulative updates and so on. So, so the most current service pack release is still supported by Microsoft of Config Man 2012. It does have full support of Windows 10 as a client, so all the different configuration manager features do work on Windows 10 as a client. However, Config Man 2012 only supports the first two releases of Windows 10. So builds 15.07 and 15.11, which 15.07 is certainly out of product support, and 15.11 is right at the end of the product support lifecycle. I think they were moving to 18 months, so it's going to be right there, if not already out now. So, um, But so nothing in the last um, year or so is supported as far as the releases of Windows 10. Um, so you're limited there. And when you were doing OSD deployment of Windows 10, in the box that were in Config Man 2012, all you had was 
the rip and replace scenarios. Um, so bare metal client deployment or um, the rip and replace type scenario break fix. Uh, there's no in place upgrade support. Now the config man product group did come out with um, a an out of box solution you could download, which was a series of scripts and task sequences you could use to do an in place upgrade. But it was um, kind of a some people call it a hacky solution because it wasn't included in the box and stuff you had to do outside of the normal process. So that brings us up to configuration manager current branch. Obviously, it is a currently supported version of the product, at least the last few releases anyway. Um, configuration manager is very much like Windows 10 where they only support a build for a certain period of time. And for the initial releases of configuration manager current branch, that support statement was for a year that you would they would support a build like 1511 of configuration manager current branch for a year's time frame so at the end of last year 1511 technically would have come out kind of come out of support um, so and then they had um, from 1511 they went to 1602 which technically would be out of support now 1606 you're right at that end of the light time frame for 1606 because um, 1706 will be due out um, uh, fairly soon. So now the configuration manager product group is moving to that 18 month cycle as well. So um, going forward, all the builds will be supported for 18 months. So the current branch release is going to be your best to com for complete Windows 10 management. So not just the deployment process, but the management of the Windows 10 client and taking advantage of some of those Windows 10 features. Um, will be done in the current branch release of Configuration Manager. And that'll be part three of our presentation that we'll go through in a couple of weeks where we'll talk about some of those other features. Now, this includes all the Windows 10 uh, versions that are supported by Microsoft, including future releases of Windows 10. Now, with that said, you may need to make sure that you update your Configuration Manager version, the current branch version, to support newer builds of Windows 10, such as you're not supported to use or manage Windows 10 1703, the creator's update, with any version of Configuration Manager less than Config Man version 1702. So you do need to take that into account. Now there is a, I loaded up here for you, um, this is a Microsoft TechNet doc that goes ahead and talks about um, Windows 10 as a client support in Configuration Manager. Um, so it is one of the TechNet docs here. And you can see in the middle here, 1703, which is the Windows 10 version. It's not supported by Configman 1610 or 1606. Um, and it is supported by 1702. Um, so backwards compatibility, just compl meaning they haven't completed all their testing on it yet. Uh, but they expect all the features to work. Um, but certainly no support for testing or uh, uh, 1703 in anything less than 1702 of configuration manager i know it's really confusing with all the numbers that are flowing around now so you gotta watch that but but this is a great knock here to um to bookmark and look at um you can just go search on supported configurations just go to support for windows or for clients and then support for windows 10 as a client and it will keep you'll be able to keep up to date with that to see what's going on including the Windows 10 ADK versions that we'll talk about later on. All right, um, so with that, um, OSD. So to deploy Windows 10 using Configuration Manager, which is what Microsoft recommends, that you use Configuration Manager as your way of deploying your operating systems, especially Windows 10, you had all the normal operating system deployment scenarios of the bare metal deployment, the rip replace, the break fix, whatever you want to call them all as well as built-in in-place upgrade support. So the ability of doing an upgrade from Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, directly to Windows 10, whatever the supported build is that you're trying to deploy, um, without having to do a, like a, the wipe and load scenario. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, and that's what I'm going to do initially in the presentation today. We're going to do the in-place upgrade, because that's what Microsoft recommends. And then I probably won't get to it today, but in next week's presentation, I'll show you how to do a bare metal client deployment of Windows 10 as well, because you very likely are going to have to do that, because um, uh, you're going to get brand new boxes for, for new employees and so on. All right, so do you do an in-place upgrade or the rip and replace scenario? So those are the two primary options you have, no matter how you initiate the rip and replace type scenario. Um, okay, the replacement. 
uh, option. It's good if you want to start fresh. I know there's some people that just have a hang up. So they're kind of dinosaurs like myself that have been around for a long time. And back in the days when um, DOS 6.1 didn't upgrade very well from 6.0 um, and it would leave files around and you never knew if you had incompatibility. So they just like to do a wipe and load. Um, so get rid of the old stuff and, and go with the new stuff. So there's people out there that like that process. They just feel better about it, not having any old files that might cause conflicts or just waste this space and cause some problems in the future. So obviously, if you're doing a hardware refresh, so you guys are probably doing hardware refreshes on a three-year cycle. And if that's the case, then that's a great time um, to, that, to not necessarily do a rip and replace, but you may just do a, a, a bare metal deployment at that point in time. Uh, but that's good to do. When you're moving your architecture, so if you're still running old x86 systems and you want to move to obviously the newer standard of x64, which have been around for a lot of years now, but there's still some people with x86 around there. If you're changing your hard disk partitioning scheme, um, so you want to format the hard drive and do some repartitioning of it, um, different scenarios, creating one big drive versus multiple different logical drives, whatever. Um, now, you do have to remember in a, in a wipe and load scenario that you do have to reinstall all your apps and manually back up and restore your data files unless you're using some utility like USMT to save off your data and restore it after your new operating system is installed in the environment. In place upgrade, on the other hand, is Microsoft's recommended way to move to Windows 10 from Windows 7, Windows 8, and Windows 8.1. So if you don't have any requirements listen to the previous slide where you're moving from x86 to x64 or you want to wipe out the hard drive and, and repartition it or those type of scenarios, then great to do an in-place upgrade. It's generally quicker. There's fewer actions that have to be completed, like you're not formatting the hard drive, you're not rebit lockering the hard drive and so on. So it's going to be generally a lot faster. It does keep your apps and data intact um, because you're just doing an upgrade and not doing a wipe and load. Now, one of the cool things about the in-place upgrade is that it gives you 30 days to try it out, see if you like it, and if not, you can always revert back to your old operating system. So it keeps your Windows 7 or 8 or 8.1 intact in a renamed folder that you could always do a revert process on and restore back to that old OS and, and drop the Windows 10 thing, although you're going to have to be moving to Windows 10 anyway because that's the wave of the future at Microsoft. So um, you are going to be going that route. So. So it, it, when all possible, you want to do the in-place upgrade. Now, I know there's reasons people want to do the wipe and load, and that's fine. Um, but just keep in mind that you may wind up using a combination of methods uh, for your current hardware, so hardware that's supported and newer hardware, and you're running a, a more current operating system like Windows 7 later, in-place upgrade, fantastic. Um, you can you may do bare metal because you're getting brand new hardware that you're doing in your hardware replacements or for brand new employees um, you're expanding you just need more hardware so um, you'll do a bare metal deployment for those uh, you might again need to do the rip and replace we get really old hardware really old operating systems maybe you still got some windows xp out there that you're not admitting um, and you there's not a supported upgrade process from windows xp to windows 10 so um, you may do the whip, rip and replace or wipe and load scenario so just don't think you're limited to one decision as to one type of deployment. You can mix and match whatever works out best for your environment. Okay, so with all that kind of background stuff, let's jump into what do you need to do in Config Manager to get yourself ready for, this, uh, for any OS deployment, but um, some things in Windows 10. So first thing you have to do, um, Config Manager current branch requires a Windows 10 um, ADK. You can... The minimum version required is the original Windows 10 1507 ADK. So that's the base minimum you have to have to install or upgrade to Config Manager current branch. With that said, the more current the version of the ADK, the more updates, the more fixes it's going to have in it to, to fix problems that they had in the previous releases as well as the later releases of the ADK are going to have support for the newer versions of Windows 10 that you may not have in older versions of the ADK. And I know a lot of people stick with um, an older ADK and they're successfully able to deploy newer builds of Windows 10. And that's fine. 
I just it's not a tested scenario by Microsoft so it may not be a supported scenario doing that so as a general rule you want to try and keep up on the latest ADK version um, so again that does give you support for the newer versions of Windows as well as they fix problems in the previous releases of the ADK and honestly every single ADK that's come out has had its issues they've all had bugs in them that have been identified and they've had to come out with updates to the ADK hot fixes or wait for a newer ADK to fix a problem um, so every single one that's come out has had problems so um, that's just the way it is there's just so much code in there uh, honestly I've heard uh, the best about the ADK from 1703. So the most recent release of the ADK seems to have the best press around it as far as um, comments. So if I go back to that same support document, um, here we look at the Windows 10 ADK. Um, here it tells you the Windows 10 ADK version, and it tells you what builds of Configuration Manager are supported with it. And again, 1703 is only supported with the Config Man 1702 um, release um, and backwards compatibility with um, uh, 1607 um, the ADK so so just keep that in mind as well as you're looking at what you're doing generally recommended to be up on the latest um, ADK version all right so next um, WinPE boot images so you're gonna have to have boot images so boot images are used in a vast majority of your operating system deployment scenarios and therefore getting your client or your computer into a state with a base OS so it can do some stuff to install your real OS. So it's the WinPE is a stripped down version, in this case of Windows 10, that gives you enough networking and OS to be able to access the network, download your real OS image, and then format the hard drive, download it, and get all the stuff deployed, as well as your drivers and your config manager and your apps and software updates and so on. So as you deploy, as you install a configuration manager or do an upgrade or migration, whatever it is, um, you're going to have built-in or default um, boot images as part of config manager that come from the ADK version. So they'll match whatever version of the ADK you have. So if you have 1703 ADK, you have boot images. Uh, the x86, x64 boot images will be built based on that 1703 version of the ADK. Now, a lot of people will wind up modifying um, or have to make modifications to the boot image and you have two different scenarios you can go through there you can take the default boot images the x64 or x86 is built in and modify those default ones or you can create custom boot images and modify those as you need um, and so it's whatever you want to do I find most people are more comfortable with creating their own custom boot images and leaving the default ones alone so just taking the base one that comes built in they basically create a copy of it and use that same one as a source and then they do all their modifications in it uh, but it's whatever you feel most comfortable with so some of the common modifications you're going to make you'll install some optional components such as PowerShell support or .NET framework um, MDAC components whatever it happens to be you might have to install drivers now with that the recommendation is to keep your driver import that you import into boot images as minimal as possible because um, you don't want to bloat the size of your image and you just don't want to have a lot of stuff in there that cause conflicts so keep it as minimal as possible we'll talk more about that momentarily and possibly enabling command line support so the f8 command line support so that when you're in the WinPE image scenario and you have a problem you can press the f8 button go to a command prompt get access to your log files for looking and doing troubleshooting um, so that's a very common thing that's done as well so if you do create your own custom boot images, remember that you have to enable Pixie support for them. And I'll show you that when I get to my first demo here uh, momentarily. Um, used to be you had to do that for the default boot images as well, and they made that change back in Config Manager 2012, maybe Service Pack 1 or R2, I don't remember now. But for custom boot images that you add yourself, you do have to remember to enable um, Pixie to allow them to be deployed from a Pixie um, distribution point. Uh, is not enabled by default once you've got your boot images all prepared the way you want them to be you then need to make sure you distribute them to your distribution points so that your computers have access to them so that they can have that base OS to do the rest of the task sequence process now we just mentioned drivers a moment ago 
So um, you'll have to import dry device drivers. Um, and I know people have thousands of device drivers in their environment because they have lots of different hardware models and they might have different network drivers, different storage drivers, maybe you need different video drivers, whatever it happens to be. Um, so they have lots of different device drivers based on hardware platforms for the different models of Dell or HP or Lenovo or Toshiba, whatever it is they happen to have. And they usually wind up creating folders to store those different um, manufacturers, then folders inside those manufacturers for their different um, hardware platforms. So they can keep those drivers um, unique. Um, so as a, but as a general rule, you want to import the minimum number that you really have to use. Um, the more drivers you have, the more your driver library, as it's called, expands, the more things that have to be searched for, and the more that you have to do your manual management and moving of drivers into different folders and so on, and getting rid of older, out-of-date ones and so on. Now, as far as drivers go, inject only the required ones into your boot images, and usually that would only be network and storage drivers are necessary. Um, because all the rest of the stuff, you're not really going to use video and all the sound in, in WinPE. You're going to wait for the full OS for those. And only put those drivers in your boot images if the default drivers in the default images don't work to do what you need to do, to access the network and access your hard drive. So you want to keep your boot images as clean as possible as far as drivers, just so that they're, uh, they can accommodate as many different models as possible and make them smaller for downloading across the wire and so on. Now, we'll talk about, um, I think in the next slide, operating system images. And one of the ways of creating an operating system image is through something called a capture process. So a capture process involves deploying manually a version of the OS that you want to deploy, let's say Windows 10, 1703. So manually installing Windows 10, 1703 or through some other automated process, including Config Manager. Um, but creating it, one of those reference computers, as it's called, getting it patched the way it needs to be, get the applications installed that you want everybody to have. Obviously, you have the drivers that you need to have in there and so on. And then you go and capture that running operating system into what's called a WIM file. So if you did a capture of an existing system so that you have a WIM file that you're deploying out, you should already have all the drivers that you need from that captured system because you already had injected all the drivers for the network and the storage and video and everything else you need um, into your running system, because it is working, um, and then you've captured that. So the only reason you have to in inject more there would be if you need to have unique drivers for unique computer models. So you want to have a base image that works in all your different manufacturers or all the different versions or models of the same manufacturer, and maybe they have different drivers, then you may have to have different drivers available to you. If using the install.wim, which comes as part of your operating system media, you may need to add drivers via your task sequence. And I'll show you what that looks like when we get to one of the demos. And then add device drivers to driver packages, and then distribute those driver packages to your distribution points. So, so far, we've got an, oper uh, an ADK, we've got boot images, we've got device drivers, and why are we not, oh, there we go. Okay, and then your Windows, your files you want to deploy. So Windows 10 source file, since we're talking about deploying Windows 10, it's the same basic process if it was Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, but we're obviously doing Windows 10 here. So Windows 10 source files. There's a couple of different ways of doing this. So what we're going to be doing in today's presentation is the operating system upgrade package. So the operating system upgrade package uses the flat Windows 10 source media. So you go to your volume licensing service center, you download whatever build of Windows 10 you want to deploy, whatever edition, um, you get an ISO file out of that, and then inside that ISO file are a bunch of different folders, a bunch of different files in that. You just take that ISO file, all the contents of it, and you move that over to Config Manager as the source for your operating system upgrade package. So it uses that entire set of files that you specify as your source. And that's used in your OSD in-place upgrade scenario for Windows 7 and later up to Windows 10. Now, if you're doing any of those other scenarios, the bare metal deployment, the wipe and load, break fix, and so on, um, or your um, standalone media or boot media type scenarios, you'll use an operating system image. 
So an operating system image comes from either a captured system, as we talked about a couple of minutes ago. So you install a Windows 10 1703 computer, all the apps, all the device drivers, all the software updates, all the settings, whatever you want, get that all configured appropriately. Then you do a sysprep and capture process on it to create this WIM file, Windows Imaging Format file, um, a WIM file, which you then add as an operating system image inside Config Manager. And then you deploy that out to your computers that you want to move to Windows 10. Alternately, if you don't want to go through that capture process, if you want to use a generic image inside your Windows 10 source media, and again, it started with, I believe, Windows 7, um, you have an install.wim file. That's a Microsoft-based generic Windows 10, in this case, image that's not customized at all. It's bare metal, or it's bare minimum, so it's just the way Microsoft deploys Windows 10, and then you can utilize it and then modify it through your task sequence to add additional applications, to add additional drivers, to add additional, install appropriate software updates, or add those things after the fact once the client gets deployed and joins whatever appropriate collections to get your appropriate software based on task sequence deployments as well as um, your collection scenarios that you have set up. So a couple different scenarios there as far as your source files. And again, we'll look at this and demo here momentarily. Both operating system images as well as operating system upgrade packages require distribution to at least one accessible distribution point for the computer you're trying to get migrated or up updated to Windows 10. And then this will be accessed via the network access account while you're in WinPE mode. So when you're in that bare metal or bare provisioning mode of the operating system we're running WinPE, um, you don't have, you have network connectivity, but you don't have a domain join scenario, so you can't use the computer account to access the DP, and you're running as local system, there's no user really logged on, so you can't use user account to access the DP, so you have to use something called the network access account. So you have to make sure that you have a network access account prepared in your environment that's accessible to your distribution point. So site systems, so we're almost there to the first demo, hang in there. Um, so site systems, obviously you have to have a site server so you can create the environment, you can create your images, your upgrade package, your drivers, your um, boot images and task sequences and so on. Site database server where all this stuff gets stored um, as far as your configuration goes, your policies. Management point which your clients will access to retrieve policies. And your distribution point which is obviously where you're going to go to get the content, the boot images and, the, and your um, operating system images and applications and so on. Now, almost every customer is also going to have a software update point for patching, a reporting services point to do reporting, and a fallback status point so you can check on your client deployment status as far as the configuration manager client goes. And there certainly are other site system roles as well. If you're going to be doing bare metal deployments, uh, then you're going to be using a Pixie enabled distribution point. So you just take a, at least one distribution point and enable it as a Pixie DP, and I'll show you how to do that. And then you'll probably also want to have a state migration point. So if you're doing kind of the OS replacement scenarios, you would need to want to back up and restore your user documents. And that's what a state, mi state migration point can do for you. Um, so that would go ahead and help you with that data retention and restoration. I already mentioned the network access account um, used to access your distribution points when you're in the WinPE mode. And then a boundary group. So clients or computers have to access the distribution points when they have access to them, that's done through boundary groups. So you need to make sure that your boundary group includes any computers that are going to be migrated to Windows 10. Um, so especially for bare metal clients, if you're using DHCP, which is a very common scenario with bare metal client deployment, is getting an IP address from DHCP in scenario. If so, then you need to make sure that your boundary group includes the IP addresses that are in your DHCP scope. Um, otherwise, they may not have access to the distribution point to get access to that content. If you're doing an in-place upgrade scenario, those clients you're deploying the in-place upgrade scenario to, that task sequence to, they're already config man clients. They already have access to your distribution point, so they already should be in your boundary group. But just make sure that any computers you're going to be deploying Windows 10 to have access to a distribution point um, inside your boundary groups. Okay, so finally our first demo. So I know it was a lot of prep work we had to go through, but 
let's go ahead and jump over and show you this some stuff and then we'll kick off a deployment so all right so first thing we want to look at is if we go to control panel and and obviously I have Windows 10 I actually am running 1702 um, so I am running the latest current branch release so I obviously have to have a Windows 10 deployment kit installed so the Windows 10 ADK Windows assessment deployment kit it is installed um, so you have to have that otherwise config manager will, won't let you install config manager itself so we're good there um, if I go to software library I'll just oh, I just moved off I'll go back there uh, so go to operating systems so boot images and here are my two default boot images that came in config manager from the ADK so you can see the boot image and the version. There's an x86 and an x64 version. I have not modified those at all. Those are the default boot images. Now I have gone in there and created a custom boot image. And this is for our Cyrus and product called Commence, which is our OSD front end. And we're not going to go through Commence today, but I just have it for demos of Commence. And here's when I, I made some customizations too, so I can show you how to do customizations on this one I've already done. So um, here you can see the, the image that it has. Um, I've not imported any drivers here, but if I wanted to import drivers, I would just go to the drivers tab, click new, and it shows me all the drivers I have con connected or imported into my environment. And I can go ahead and filter for a driver. Uh, I don't have any VMware ones that match the criteria of, of hiding um, that are storage or network drivers, which is by default. That's the only ones that make sense in a boot image is network and storage drivers. Um, and then ones that are not signed as well. So. Um, you just pick and choose whichever drivers make sense for you, and you go ahead and click OK, and that will go and add those drivers in to your boot image. For optional components, is very common as well. So here you can see by default there's some components built in, some WinPE scripting, secure startup, there's some WDS tools, um, WMI scenarios, as well as, scroll on down here, oh, that's it. I've gone ahead and added in, for commence, we go ahead and use .NET. So I've gone ahead and added it in .NET. But all you do here is go to the new and pick and choose what components you want. Uh, for example, you want PowerShell, you can go ahead and add that and tells you, hey, there's other stuff you have to have for PowerShell. So you can go ahead and select the component. Or if you want HTML support, you go ahead and select it. So you select whatever components you want, click OK, and then when you click OK again, it's gonna say, hey, you've updated your boot image, do you wanna deploy, update your, the new version on your distribution points? And then lastly, customization things, if you go to customization tab, here you can see that my scenario, it's very common when you get into some more complex OSD scenarios, you can have a um, command or a, a pre-start command, an OSD front end that would pop up and ask end users some interactive questions to help guide them through the process. Maybe it's what computer name do you want to use? What's your username? So I can set up UDA relationship, et cetera. So here we're kicking off a um, preloader uh, going to a website and launching off our commands, and here's where the source directory for these files are, the preloader.exe, you specify that. If you wanted that um, F8 command prompt support, that's this checkbox here, enable command prompt, it says testing only, and you generally don't need to have that once you've done your full deployments, you're out in production, you can re remove that, but when you're doing testing stuff, you have to get access to the log files and WinPE, it's good to have that on. And just for reference is data source, here you can see the source WIM file that I'm pulling in as my boot image. So I'm going to the site server, my share, my site code is CHQ, OSD boot x86, or x64, sorry, boot.wim is my source files I'm using. And I take that source image, which came from the ADK, making those customizations to it, and then dumping it onto my distribution points, which right now, are set here, just one distribution point primary. Now, one other thing to point out here is that back on that data sources tab, here's that checkbox I mentioned, that because this is a custom boot image and I want to make it available to Pixie, you have to make sure that you select this checkbox. On your default boot images that are coming to product, that's already been set for you. But for any custom boot images you add, you do need to go ahead and add this checkbox, otherwise you will not have access to this boot image from a Pixie enabled distribution point. So just remember that. Drivers, here's just a bunch of different drivers I've imported. So you'd have the appropriate drivers that you want to have. We saw that when we were looking at the boot image um, earlier. So that's all fine. Um, my operating systems. So I have two different uh, scenarios. 
So for the bare metal deployment, I have a Windows 10 Enterprise image. And you can see if I go look at the properties and go to the data source, you'll see that this is using, I'm using the install.wim. So I'm just using the generic Windows 10 image that comes in the operating system. So when you download your Windows 10 media from um, the Volume License and Servicing Center, um, you'll have that. And I just go into those files and using that. So if I show you that, uh, if I go to File Manager, that's sitting down here in stuff, Windows 10 source, it's down in sources, and oops, go over here, and there's install.wim. So it's, I'm just pulling this one file out of this directory, and you can see it's a fairly large file, three and a quarter gigabytes in size. So that's the one file I'm using as my source. Now for what we're doing today, we're doing an operating system upgrade, so we're going to use the operating system upgrade packages. If you're still sitting in Config Man 2012, this was called operating system installers, or install packages, I believe is what they called it, and they renamed it um, in the current branch release. Um, but so I have Windows 10 source, and if I go look at the properties here, you'll see that if I go to data source, it's using a share, and it's called stuff, and it's Windows 10 source. It's actually that exact same directory structure here that we saw, where I got the install.wim, I'm just using all the files here as my Windows 10 source files, as opposed to just the install.wim that was sitting here inside the, um, inside the sources directory. So it's taking all these files, including install.wim, um, and making that my source um, files available for my environment. So I've added a operating system upgrade package. I've op for in-place upgrades, I've added a bare metal deployment scenario. Notice that both these are distributed out to my distribution point. We'll look at that later on, but there's my OS image, and here's my upgrade package has been distributed. Um, now, uh, distribution point. So if I go to administration, go to distribution points, we see I have two distribution points in my environment, member and primary, but only one of them is configured for Pixie scenarios, and that's my my primary site server is a DP, I'm um, called primary. Um, so it is PIX enabled. So all I did here is just went to the DP properties, I went to the Pixie tab, and all I said in my environment was enable Pixie, allow it to respond to incoming Pixie requests, and enable unknown computer support. A lot of people don't like to do that. They like to pre-register their computers inside Config Manager so you don't have anybody off the street or a consultant walking in, plopping in their laptop and getting your boot image and your OS image. Um, instead, you can configure it to not have unknown computer support, when then it will look at your um, SMBIOS GUID or your MAC address. And we can do that configuration, pre-registering computers, utilizing the ConfigMan portal that we have from Cyrus, and or you can do that in the ConfigMan console. And I turned off the require a password, um, and I'm making sure it can respond to all network interfaces and allow user device affinity with automatic approval is what I configured on my Pixie on DP. And then it enabled WDS automatically, did all the configuration, and bingo, I was off and running. So very, very simple for me. And again, that's not really relevant for an in-place upgrade, but it is will be good for the bare metal deployment scenarios. Network access account, so as long as I'm sitting here, um, you'll want to have a network access account for some of your scenarios. That's under site configuration, sites, configure site components, software distribution, um, and then network access account. I only have one. You can have up to 10, I believe, is what this is the supported limit there. And it's just a, again, a Windows account, a, a domain account that would have access to your distribution points. So just a domain user, so it would have access to the DP content for when you're in WinPE scenarios and the computer account's not valid or there's no logged on user account. So you just have appropriate those. And then lastly is going to be our boundaries and boundary groups. So if we go to hierarchy configuration, Here's my boundaries. Now, in my case, I'm using uh, my existing clients are 80 joins, so they'll be part of the Config Manager site, Active Directory boundary, Active Directory site boundary. Um, when I'm in a bare metal scenario, here's the full uh, IP subnet range, which includes my DHCP scope for bare metal provisioning. And you can see they both have group count one, which means they're a member of the boundary group that I have, local clients, 
And if I go to properties, you'll see here that it has both the AD site as well as my IP address subnet, the full range from the IP address subnet. Okay, so my environment is all fully prepped uh, and ready to go. So let's jump back over here. And so now, before you go ahead and just create a task sequence we'll talk about and deploy your task sequence out and try and upgrade your clients or do bare metal provisioning, whatever, you want to make sure, especially in an upgrade scenario, that you have upgradable targets so you don't just get a whole bunch of failures. And there's a couple of different ways to do this that are very, very easy. One is using the upgrade assessment that is part of Config Manager through Windows 10. And the other one is Upgrade Analytics, which you can do is through Config Manager as well as a cloud service um, through Microsoft, which reports your upgradability or your upgrade readiness. Um, you can see that in the Config Manager. You could also create your own custom queries and collections in Config Manager based on criteria you know that would be applicable for your environment. So you can certainly do that if you want to. It's just more work on you. You have to figure out what those criteria are, what you want to have for minimum disk space and, and memory and processor uh, and so on, and maybe applications and so on, doing your own analysis and create your collections through query rules as to those that meet those requirements and do that. There are a set of upgrade assessment reports built into the product. However, honestly, they're pretty old, so they're not really going to be most value to most people, I don't think. So you may not want to spend a lot of time on the upgrade assessment reports. But Okay, so for here, so upgrade assessment, if you want to do that, um, it's pretty easy. Um, so this is a very, very easy way. It just uses a simple checkbox in a, in a task sequence. That checkbox says to perform Windows Setup Compatibility Scan without starting the upgrade. What that will do, it'll just do, go through the process of like it's trying to do a Windows 10 upgrade from Windows 7, 8, or 8.1, and it just reports back, would I be successful from the aspect of any incompatibilities? And it, so it runs this command, Windows Setup, so Windows Setup.exe, with this slash compat scan only option. Um, so you can create your own task, oops, sorry about that, create your own task sequence or um, use the one that I'll show you here momentarily. Um, now the results get returned in log files, not in any kind of status or anything, but in log files, and they come in as hex codes. Um, so you're going to have to convert some of these codes over, and here's a chart of the most common ones that you're going to see for the return codes on that. What you obviously want is the 0xc190210. That means no compatibility issues, so success on that running out of task sequence um, up, upgrade assessment. Now, the upgrade analytics, that uses an online service um, through Microsoft Azure to go ahead and perform an assessment on your clients. So data is generated online, what's generated on your clients, and then it's sent through the telemetry process up to Microsoft. It utilizes OMS upgrade um, analytics, uh, so log analytics through OMS to parse that data and then brings it back down to Config Manager and displays it into your console in the uh, Upgrade Analytics dashboard. You'll be able to see in the console. So it does require a little bit more infrastructure, not necessarily on-premise, but um, uh, stuff. You have to have Microsoft Azure and Operations Management Suite subscri OMS subscriptions. You create an application in Azure AD. You grant permissions in OMS that workspace to the resource group. You then enable integration in the Config Manager console for that, um, that uh, data from that um, uh, works, OMS workspace, that application. And then you have to enable the telemetry data on your clients to get the readiness assessment from your clients to the telemetry data from Windows 8 or Windows 7, 8, and 8.1 up, uh, up to the cloud service so they can get analyzed and then brought back down to the um, on-premise solution. So let's go look at what that looks like. So in my Config Manager environment, so if I go to Software Library and go to Task Sequences, which we'll cover Task Sequences here momentarily, but here's my Windows 10 Upgrade Assessment Task Sequence that I created. And if I do an edit on it, uh, the really the only command I need is this one, Upgrade Operating System. And here's the command you want to make sure you enable the checkbox perform Windows Setup Compatibility Scan without starting upgrade. Just enable that one checkbox, and then it will not do the Windows 10 upgrade 
it will just scan it to see if it thinks it would pass a Windows 10 upgrade process. Now the task sequence by default is going to do a check for readiness check to make sure your target client has enough memory, processor, and it's a window, a client-based operating system as opposed to server-based operating system. You get rid of this. And certainly you would need a restart computer um, action in there just for doing the upgrade assessment. Um, I left it in there just to show you that this is the default. So all I did here was went to create task sequence, chose the option of upgrade an operating system from an ex from an upgrade package. So I selected that. I gave it a name. And then I selected my upgrade package, my Windows 10 source package I had. I told it not to do any software updates, not to install any applications. And then it went ahead and created this task sequence here. And I just went and selected that one checkbox. Now, certainly, again, I can just create a generic task sequence and add that one command line in there if I want to. Um, and I take this one and remove those extra couple of things in there. So then I went ahead and deployed this. If I look at deployments, uh, so I have it deployed to a collection called Windows 10 Upgrade Assessment. And I went ahead and deployed that. And I ran it on my two client computers. If I go to deployments, Windows 10 Upgrade Assessment, you see I'm 100% compliant on those two. So it went ahead and ran the task sequence successfully. Now, if I switch over to my Windows 7 client image, here we are. Um, I switch over to him. Here's my, it ran on this client. Here's my SMS TS log, so the SMS task sequence log. If I go ahead and open up that log file, and the easy thing to do is you do a search for single quote, scan only, single quote. And then that takes you down to the, probably towards the end of your log file. Oops, went a little bit too far there. And here's, you see the commands that you're interested in. And here you can see it's executing a command line. I'll show you that command line in a moment. Exit code 324-744-0400, which when you convert that over, it converts to the 0XC1900210, which we saw on that one slide was success. And here you see this resolution window setup in scan only mode has found no compatibility issues. So it came back with a success um, process. So here's that command it was trying to execute. And if I scroll towards the end of it, uh, let me get my mouse back over here. There you see the option of slash compat scan only. So it's doing a slash compat scan only um, on this client. So it still is running Windows 7, point, Windows 7 at this point in time. So if I go here and look at my property, oops, properties of my computer, Windows 7 Enterprise, and it ran this task sequence, all it did was collect the assessment data. Now, I don't have um, all the other stuff set up to do the upgrade analytics, but what you would have to do is go to your administration workspace and go to your cloud services and upgrade analytics connector, you'd go ahead and create an upgrade analytics connector here, which you would go ahead and have to specify your Azure Active Directory tenant, your client ID, your secret key that you have to generate, and then enable the upgrade analytics. And then that would go ahead and once you enable telemetry on your clients and send the data up and then bring it back down. And that data would be reported here in the monitoring workspace in the upgrade analytics dashboard. And you'd see that data here as far as how many clients you have that are in Windows 10 readiness mode and what the results are from that. But you do have to enable telemetry data on your clients in order to um, get that data brought back. Okay, so we've got, oh, we're at the top of the hour. So let's go ahead and get this, um, try and get this guy to the point where we kick off this task sequence so I can let it run over the our next week and we'll come back here. So let's go ahead and just talk about a couple more of these things real quick and then we'll We'll wrap it up for the day. Like I said, I didn't know how far we're going to get in today's session. And it looks like we're going to get uh, about where I kind of guessed, uh, but not quite as far as I thought we might. So let's go talk about this quickly. Then we'll go and hit the few questions you guys have. And we'll wrap it up for today. And we'll pick it up again next week. OK, so upgrading. So we're going to initiate the upgrade process with an in-place upgrade task sequence. So the actual process of moving from your old OS to the new Windows 10 OS is done through something called a task sequence. So task sequences are what we call the final piece of the puzzle, as they contain the commands or actions to complete, such as, for most scenarios, boot from this boot image, 
partition the hard drive for BIOS or UEFI, enable BitLocker, um, go ahead and download this specific OS image or OS upgrade package, install these specific drivers to do auto detect device drivers, um, join this domain, this OU using this account, install these applications or packages, install my software updates, install the config man client, um, save off my user state data, restore my user state data, and so on. So just a, it's a, just a sequence of steps that you want to run through. Um, so oftentimes your task sequence was, will reference a boot image, an OS image or OS upgrade package, device drivers, and packages and or applications. So you can create your own in place up, uh, your own in place upgrade task sequence, or um, um, you can do a bare metal scenario, replacement scenario, task sequence, whatever is appropriate for the scenario you're going through. Um, so once you've created the task sequence, I'll show you what that looks like here just in, in a moment. You deploy that task sequence. So you verify that all the content that's referenced in that task sequence is distributed to at least one distribution point that clients would have access to. You can use the references tab to validate that, and I'll show you that. Then use the deploy action to deploy the task sequence to a target collection. So you'll specify um, your target collection, your purpose, your availability, your schedule, your user experience, and so on. Now, when you're doing OSD, they generally consider these to be what's called risky deployments. So with that, it's going to go ahead and block out all of your built-in collections, except all unknown computers, which it's there for OSD specifically. And it will also block out or hide by default any custom collections that have more members than your admin configured value, which defaults to 100. But you can go ahead and change that. Okay, so let's look at that, and then we'll go ahead and wrap this guy up. Um, so here's my going back to my demo environment. So if I go back to software library, oh, let me go here, just ask as a compliance real quick. Here's my devices. And if I just um, zoom in on my devices, you can see that all my online devices are all, I had them do uh, DDR today, just make sure they're all online. And you can see that I've got Windows 7, one Windows 7. I've got Win, Windows 8.1. And then I've got a couple of um, servers that are running Windows Server 2012 R2 but those aren't obviously applicable for a Windows 10 upgrade. So I've got the Windows 7 client and Windows 8.1 client I'm going to go ahead and do an upgrade on. That's client 7 and client 81, uh, my upgrade targets. So if we go back to software library, go to task sequences, and I've got a few task sequences here. The one that's of importance to us is the upgrade to Windows 10. Um, so what I did is I went to create task sequence, and I did this same process we saw earlier, um, upgrade in the operating system from an upgrade package. I just walked through that wizard that I showed you earlier and saved that off, didn't make any changes to it. The other one, the if you look in the background here, install Windows 10, that's using the default task sequence option here of install an existing image package. That's where I want to do a wipe and load, rip and replace, bare metal, whatever it happens to be. So I selected that option and walked through the wizard. And I'll, t I'll show you that um, in next session, because um, we're out of time for this one. So my upgrade to Windows 10 task sequence, um, notice on, oops, on the advanced, uh, general tab, it's using default text. I haven't specified any parameters or any data to the end user, which you can now do in, in later versions of config man current branch. Um, it's not using a boot image because it's an existing client. So it's already got an OS to do some work with. Um, and I'm not doing any running of the program. I'm not using any custom, um, messaging inside software center. So all I've done is create, went through that task sequence wizard. Again, it's looking for my readiness. It's going to filter out clients that don't have enough memory processor or a server-based OS because I'm looking for clients. It's running this operating system upgrade, and I do not have the compatibility scan enabled on this one, so it's going to do the real upgrade. And then when it's done, it's going to restart my computer. I haven't modified anything else in here. I haven't, I haven't modified anything in this. It's the just walked to the wizard and gave it a name and pointed to my um, operating system, uh, the upgrade package. So that's it. And now I'm, I've, so I've used the references tab here. The references tab is showing me all the content that this task sequence is looking at. And you can see it's Windows 10 source. And Windows 10 source is successfully distributed to my one targeted distribution point. So it's ready to roll. And then I have created a, I've not created a deployment. So we're going to go ahead and create a deployment. We're going to deploy this guy. As soon as I click browse, it says, hey, this looks to be a high risk type scenario. So we're going to block out some stuff. So you can see all my built-in collections of the all unknown computers are gone. 
Uh, now you can see I have the the custom collection set to two. And if I remove that, you see a couple more collections pop in there because they have uh, three members on it. And you get to control how what that value is. But I want to go to that same collection where I did the upgrade assessment. So I'll go to Windows 10 Upgrade Assessment, which has two members, Client 7 and Client 81. So I'm going to go to that one. Uh, I'm going to make this available. You generally don't want to deploy task sequences for security things, um, reasons um, to make them required. Um, so we want to make them available. And because it's an operating system upgrade, it's only available to config man clients. I can't change that like you can in a other type task sequence. Because it's available, I don't have to worry about scheduling. And it's going to show task sequence progress. And we're done. So now we have a deployment created. And just to verify the collection, here's my all window or my Windows 10 upgrade assessment. And if I go to look at members, there's client 7 and client 81. So the policy has been created. Let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and force these clients to retrieve policies. So let's do a right click and client notification, download computer policy. It's got two resources. Now let's go to our Windows 10 client or Windows 7 client, sorry. And we'll get rid of log files. Let's go to Software Center. And there's my operator. Oops, this is the that's the upgrade assessment, which it says it's installed. I already ran that one. So let's look, I didn't get the policy. Let's go down to computer maintenance and the policy may just not have been created from that task sequence deployment yet. So let's do a sync policy here which is a new thing in Software Center they added a while ago. And that should bring up our, momentarily it should go ahead and bring in our new task sequence. Oh, there it is, upgrade to Windows 10. And I'll just go ahead and do a install. It tells me I'm gonna kick off a OSD process, which is kind of detrimental to my ability using the computer. And this is all the type of stuff you can now customize in Software Center with Configman 17.02 and its ability of uh, modifying the text that's deployed out to your end users. So you can modify some of this text now, uh, which I didn't do in my environment. So click install, and now it's kicking off the download process. So it's checking readiness at past the client versus server, memory and processor. Now it's doing an upgrade on the operating system. And this is gonna take uh, about 20 some minutes in my VM when I tested it the other day. So um, we're certainly not gonna get that guy finished off. So. Okay, we'll look at monitoring later on. Uh, next week's presentation, we'll go to monitoring. So just uh, since we're well past our time, we're seven minutes or whatever past, let's do, just do a quick summary and we'll get to your questions you guys have. So System Center Configuration Manager is great. Um, you really shouldn't be running any previous versions of Config Manager other than Config Man Current Branch. And realistically, because you're probably gonna wanna be deploying the Creators Update 1703, that means Config Man Current Branch 1702. Um, or if you get to wait till the 1706 version comes out, which will probably uh, be within a few weeks, I would guess, um, you could wait for that as well. Migration to Windows 10 is very easy with the in-place upgrade support, and you'll see the end result of that in next week's presentation. I'll let that guy finish off, and I'll kick off the same task sequence on my Windows 8.1 client, and I'll capture those for you, and we'll show you the results next week. Um, so you want to assess your readiness prior to your upgrade process so you can have success or higher level success. You're only deploying to those guys that are compatible until you get the others that are um, not compatible to be updated. And you can do a wipe and load, rip, replace, bare metal scenario as appropriate, which we'll do in next week's presentation as well. Um, so just a couple more things. Uh, if you guys decide that, hey, yeah, I'm tired of doing all this stuff by myself or this Windows 10 stuff looks to be more complicated than I thought it was gonna be, I want some help. Well, Cyrus and Consulting Services can help you out with that. So if you have any questions on that, they're the email address at the bottom, sales at cyrusen.com, or you can go to just email team at cyrusen.com, and we can help you out, get you information on what you need to do um, for that. Cyrus and community, so that's a kind of like a Microsoft TechNet forum. It's just for Cyrusen. We manage it ourselves. Um, so you can go in there and join that if you wish to and ask questions there on, on all the Cyrusen products, as well as just pure system center uh, technologies, like there's one specifically for configuration manager. So you can go ahead and join it. It's monitored by Cyrus and people as well as out there in the community. 
And then lastly, if you want to try the config man portal that I've mentioned a couple of times free, you can just go ahead and um, email team at Syerson.com or go to Syerson.com website. And the front page is the configuration manager portal. And there's a link where you can go and try it online or you can download an evaluation version of it or um, and check it out that way. So. All right, with that, um, I know we're well past our time, so thanks for hanging in there, guys. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in there we'll talk about, and then we'll go ahead and um, stop this guy. Again, next week, we'll pick up right here. Um, so I'll, I'll let this Windows 7 client um, upgrade to Windows 10, and then I'll kick off the upgrade process on my Windows 8.1 client, get him upgraded to Windows 10. I'll snap all my images at that point in time, and that's what we'll will be when we pick up um, on next week's presentation. So we'll show you the results of this. We'll show you how to monitor that. We'll look at the bare metal deployment process um, and all that work. And then we'll go ahead and move on to the management technology. So, all right, with that, I got uh, right now three questions um, or comments. So Andrew stating Microsoft support for Config Manager 2007 ends on the 9th of July 2019. Yeah, there's some extended support stuff, but they're not doing anything. I can tell you they're not going to be doing anything with Config Man 2007. So even though you might have extended support going for a while yet, there'll be no new service packs, no cumulative updates, um, and no hot fixes for it. They're going to be doing nothing for it other than for those that do the extended support agreements for it. Um, and certainly, again, nothing as far as any new Windows 10 stuff. So absolutely, yeah, uh, good point. It's Even though we say it's out of support, it's still in extended support. You can do that. Um, another comment, we like the upgrade option most for Windows 10 current branch updates. Windows 7 to Windows 10, not so much. Um, well, sorry to hear that, Russell. Um, yeah, so there's a couple different scenarios there. Um, once you get to Windows 10, then you can certainly do the same process to keep your Windows 10 environments up to date as you go from 1507 to 1511 to 1607 to 1703, Windows 10 builds. Um, or you can do the updates and servicing thing we'll talk about maybe in next week's presentation, if not the one after, um, but most likely next week's. Um, but um, I've heard really, really good things from people as far as the upgrade process, um, the upgrade in place migration scenario. So sorry to hear you didn't like it as well there for that. Um, and then Russell says, we like to add the setup compatibility set prior to the actual update and then only proceed when the task sequence variable um, equals. So yeah, um, so you Russell just commenting that he goes in there and they add a um, check in there. So they put a variable to say, if the compatibility results equal success, which is that number I mentioned I showed in the log file, the 3247440400, or that 0xc1900210, um, once you see that, then go ahead and go on to the um, actual upgrade process. So, so that's perfectly acceptable as well. Um, if it was me, I'd probably be doing two, two different steps. Um, I'd have the one, like I did, I'd have the assessment process, so I have a clean set of targets that I know are going to work, um, so that I only have in my collection, I'll have a collection of those that have the proper um, support, that pass the upgrade assessment process, and then I target my actual OS upgrade process to that, to the upgrade task sequence. Um, so that way I know I'm targeting those that are really gonna be successful, and I'm filtering out earlier before I even do my deployment, just in the assessment process, I'm filtering out those that are not compatible. And I fix the compatibilities, rerun the assessment, and have them then move over to the collection of guys that did pass assessment. I just happen to be using the one collection for both of those. But you can also do your scenario, Russell, that's fine, as far as doing your assessment and then only allowing the actual upgrade process to work if the assessment comes back as clean. Now, the one advantage you do have in your process is that um, with mine, with my task sequence, uh, let me go back here and show you. It, it's just it's upgrading the operating system still. Oops. Let me go back over here and go to uh, the one downside, which I didn't mention this, that you probably want to do and work with around, uh, oops, software library. When I do my upgrade assessment process here, this is actually going to download uh, that Windows 10 source. So it's going to download whatever my Windows 10 source is, and you saw it was 3.6 gig, I believe it said on the distribution point. So it's going to download that so it has the setup.exe and the install.wim, which it needs. And then it's going to go do the upgrade assessment. 
is going to pass or fail, whatever is appropriate. And then I'm going to deploy the second task sequence, which is to do the upgrade process, which is going to do that download again, because likely this stuff's not going to be in cache. Maybe it still will be, but it's going to go ahead and look at that. So, um, so you may be downloading stuff over the wire twice. So it's um, oftentimes recommended when you're doing the assessment, have the assessment pull your source from some network share so you're running it over the network as opposed to doing the download process like I was doing here. Um, so your process, you'd be downloading the source one time. So that's, that's a good point there as well. Um, okay, so a few more people have popped in here with questions. And we have a, uh, I'll hang in, I can hang in here another 15 minutes um, before I have to move to another meeting, but you guys are great with that. Windows 7 to Windows 10 task sequence has been good so far. Would be nice if customization worked as well as brand new installs. Uh, so it just depends on what type of customization. Yeah, I've not talked about customization here at all. There certainly are ways to customize computer names, which obviously an upgrade process, you're keeping the same computer name, um, customizing your start menu. Um, there's certainly ways to do that um, through PowerShell or provisioning packages or group policies that you can deploy after the fact, um, or use Config Manager to deploy some of that stuff as well. Um, so customization, so there's certainly XML files and so on you can create and help with your customizations. But yeah, the, the Config Man team knows they, and Windows team know they have some things that they keep working on to enhance the process to make it easier and more readily available and perfect for everyone because um, everyone has their own unique needs and, and desires. Um, Ken is asking, will we e will be emailing out this webinar? Um, if you attended, I don't know if you get a link to the, an email with the link if you attended the webinar. Um, certainly, if you registered and you didn't attend, you'll get an email with it. But all you do, honestly, Ken, to get a copy of this guy is just go to Vimeo.com, go to Team Cyrusen, and then this is all of our webinars, and they usually have the most current ones at the top. So by the end of the week, you should see uh, this webinar up there. Otherwise, you can go in here and search like Windows 10, uh, like you do a search on Wally. Um, oh, that's not a lot of Wally stuff there. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't know there's so much other Wally stuff. Okay, let's let's not search for Wally. Let's do Cyrus and because yeah, it took me off Cyrus and let's do uh, Cyrus and uh, Windows 10. See if that came back with better results. Nah, let's go back to Team Cyrus. Let's go to uh, Vimeo. Wow, can't type Vimeo.com. Team Cyrusen, and maybe you just got to do more descriptive searches. But yeah, you'll find up here. Here's my one I just did recently on what's new in the Config Man um, Manager portal. Uh, if we go to the next page, we'll probably find that one I did uh, with a real quick one uh, that from the Config Manager day, uh, Windows 10 deployment. Should be in here as well. Security in tune. Upgrading to Windows 10. Here's that 35 or 40 minute one on there. But you'll find it right here. So just go to vimeo.com slash Team and it will be there by the end of the week. Melanie's very good at getting those updated as, as soon as I give her um, the converted version of the file. So um, can a customized WIM be used in the in-place upgrade scenario or just an OEM version, John's asking. So um, so um, as far as I know, you can use a, uh, a it's going gonna, it's gonna to pull off, Windows is going to pull off the install.wim. Um, so if you have your own custom one, if you named it install.wim, as far as I know, that would work. I've not heard of any problems with doing that. Uh, Quinn taskbar, for instance. Yeah, there's, there's customizations. You can go to modify the taskbar, start menus, and so on, whether, again, it's through provisioning packages or group policies or um, start menus, taskbars. There are ways of doing that. It's just not as easy as, like, like you're saying, like Config Manager made it here is doing the update. So, yeah, it'd be nice when they get that a little more automated and easy for us. Windows 7 migration pain is mostly due to the UEFI changes, um, getting better with vendor solutions, but still complicated. Yeah, so that's one of the cool things with, with Config Man current branch 1702. They actually have built in some new task sequence steps to utilize some of those vendor solutions for migrating from BIOS to UEFI and made it a lot easier for you. So it's still based on vendor solutions, no doubt, but it's the, what with Config Man 1702, they now have task sequence steps for you to 
implement those vendor solutions for that migration from BIOS to UEFI. Absolutely, because in the old days, that was more of the wipe and load scenarios uh, to really do that migration. Uh, but yeah, that's getting better and better over time, but still does rely on those vendor solutions. Absolutely. Okay, it looks like that is it as far as questions go. Um, so, and we're 20 minutes past the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Um, so thank you all for taking the time to um, spend with us today on this webinar. Um, so I appreciate that, and hopefully you found it informative and helps you out with a little bit anyway. Um, so next week's webinar, what, what I, again, what I'll do is I'll let this process end, and I'll go ahead and deploy the uh, task sequence on my Windows 8.1 client, get that upgraded. I'll save off the images, and then we'll start with that and do the look at the monitoring process uh, to verify we're all good to go. Then we'll look at the bare metal deployment or the wipe and load, rip, replace, whatever you want to call it scenarios. I'll do a bare metal deployment of Windows 10 just to cover that scenario for you as well. And then we'll look at start getting into the management of Windows 10 from there. So, um, so that's where we'll go. And that's what's going to happen between now and then. I'm just going to let that this task sequence end up on my Windows 7 client. I'm going to then deploy it on my Windows 8.1 just because I run out of disk space on my laptop that I'm doing these in these deployment demos off of, um, so I have to do them in stages, otherwise the hard disk gets filled up. And I'll just snap those off, so I won't do any other magic in there, and I'll show you what we did after the fact um, next week as we get into our webinar. So you guys all have a fantastic rest of your week, and we'll see you again um, Wednesday next week, same time, same place. And again, the, the, the video should be up on the um, Vimeo.com site, the recording, within a couple of days. So certainly by the end of the week, we'll get it up there. Um, and if you don't get an announcement on it, just go look for it on Friday and you should, be, you should find it up there. With that, thanks for attending and hopefully you found it worthwhile and you guys have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you next week. Bye all.